Fox News alert on new fallout after Kentucky Senator Rand Paul mounts a dramatic, nearly 13 hour filibuster in what is being called a unique moment in political history. That is now winning praise from both sides of the aisle. That's where we begin this brand new hour of America Live. Welcome, everyone. I'm Megan Kelly. Republican Senator Rand Paul taking a stand against what he calls a threat to liberty, speaking for hours and hours during an old fashioned filibuster, blocking the confirmation, for the time being, of John Brennan, the president's pick to run the CIA in an effort to protest the Obama administration's refusal to explicitly rule out a possible drone strike on an American citizen on American soil. Senator Paul held the floor for most of the day, at times talking for more than three hours nonstop. He also had a little help from some of his fellow senators. In a rare political moment not seen in years, well, watch what happened. I rise today to begin to filibuster John Brennan's nomination for the CIA. I will speak until I can no, no longer speak. I'd like to ask your reactions to the testimony that Attorney Mr. General... Senator from Kansas, without yielding the floor if I can. Most Americans would find it um, repulsive. Mr. President, at this time I would entertain a question without yielding the floor from the Senator from Instance Oregon. Instance of an extraordinary threat to our country. Now I would yield uh, without yielding the floor for another question. And this will probably be my last uh, question. Before I get to it, let me just say that, uh, you know, all the other senators that are, and I know some, some... I have no problem. People want to talk for a long time. It's no problem. I've done it a time or two in my days. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to uh, thank the senator from Texas for coming to the floor and cheering me up. I was getting kind of tired and... Uh, I appreciate uh, bringing news from the outside world. Really, we don't want to have a standard where someone who we think might be a terrorist or we think might be engaged in something who's in a restaurant eating dinner would be killed. And I think that's something every member of this body should care about. It's not a Republican question, not a conservative question. Um, I've told them that I will remove myself from the blockage of John Brennan's nomination as soon as we get some clarification from the White House. Hey, I'm still... Absolutely, we're not going to be killing Americans not in a combat situation, that we will obey the Constitution, that the Fifth Amendment does apply to all Americans, and there aren't exceptions. But I thank you very much for the forbearance, and I yield the floor. Mr. And then the applause began. Joining us now live, Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky. Senator, welcome. I uh, hope you've had some rest now. Uh, and I want to start with you on, on the substance, because on, this, on the topic of you know, using drones against Americans here on American soil. It's never happened, and no one is threatening to do it. In fact, they're saying it's entirely hypothetical, and it's, it would be extremely unusual that the scenario would even come up. So why make an issue out of it? Well, you know, the oath of office for the president says, I will protect and defend the Constitution. It doesn't say, I intend to when it's convenient. And... This administration has talked about selective application of the Fifth Amendment. Drone strikes overseas are often done to people in non-combat situations, in restaurants, walking on the street, in cars, and in their house while they sleep. That's not the kind of standard we can have in our country. If you're sitting in a cafe, I don't care who you're emailing or what you're talking about, if they think you are associated with terrorism, you need to be arrested and you need to get your day in court. This is a fundamental American freedom, and that's what we're fighting for around the world. If we give up on that, I think we've, we've done a great disservice to those who are defending our country. But there's a distinction between killing terrorists affiliated with al-Qaeda who want to kill us overseas with drones and killing Americans. And the only American we've intentionally killed with a drone overseas is Anwar al-Awlaki. And there was quite a bit of evidence about his willingness and operational planning to kill Americans. Um, and, and in that instance, the president had announced that, uh, and people had filed lawsuits about it, and so on. It, you know, and so it, it was a, it, it wasn't some secret plan to kill an American here on American soil using a drone. It's a different situation. You're right, and it's different overseas than it will be here. It's different in the battlefield than it will be here, which gets precisely to the argument I have with some other Republicans who say, well, the battlefield is everywhere. There is no limitation. President Obama says this. Some members of my party say the battle has no geographic limitations and the laws of war apply. It's important to know that the law of war that they're talking about means no due process. 
And I agree with that in a battle. When someone's shooting at you, you don't ask for, they don't get Miranda rights or warrants or a trial, you shoot them. When anybody's actively attacking you, you're allowed to repulse that with lethal authority. However, if they're not engaged in combat and if they're in the United States, I don't think that the law of wars apply to the United States. The police act differently in the United States than the military acts overseas. There's different rules of engagement. I don't want to give up on the procedural constitutional protection that we have through all of the amendments, particularly the Fifth and Sixth Amendment. Jury trial is an important thing. Arrest and being charged, determining your guilt, these are really important things. We can't leave that determination up to one politician to decide guilt or innocence. As you know, there is a history, sadly, in this country of, of our having to make decisions like this. And when you first wrote to the Attorney General expressing your concern about whether we might use a drone here on American soil, he wrote back saying, look, you know, it, hypothetically in some imaginary circumstance, you know, something might be possible, he said, if necessary to protect the homeland. In circumstances of a catastrophic attack, for example, Pearl Harbor or what happened on 9-11. On 9-11, that fourth plane that those brave passengers brought down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, uh, Vice President Cheney, with the okay from President Bush, had authorized that plane to be shot down. And that would have killed yeah. a whole lot of American civilians to save thousands of lives. I mean, so why would you tell this president that he doesn't have that authority well, if I'm something not, else would I'm happen? Not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying he doesn't have that authority. We're talking about targeted drone attacks on individual American citizens. I have never argued that the president doesn't have the right to make immediate decisions to protect our country from attack. When it's an imminent attack like that, F-16s were scrambling. I have no opposition to that. So Attorney General Holder answered a question we weren't asking. We're talking about targeted strikes of individuals. We're talking about John Smith, who's eating in a cafe in Seattle, but happens to be also emailing a cousin of his who lives in the Middle East. And that cousin, someone has determined, might be a terrorist. Now he is associated with terrorism. Does the country or the president get to decide, oh, he's an enemy combatant and he gets no lawyer and he gets no trial? His guilt is, I think, up to discussion, and you shouldn't drop a drone strike on him, and you shouldn't target an American citizen. We have a tough time sometimes. If you've ever been to a jury trial, it's not always easy to determine innocence and guilt. So if you're not lifting an arm against your country, if you're sitting in a cafe unarmed, you should be arrested like any other criminal. But you can't be killed with a targeted missile strike. And the president's been asked directly about this, and he's evaded the question. He has not answered, are you going to target American citizens on American soil? He said, well, we might have different rules outside than inside. And I say, for goodness sakes, you better. But I really can't conceive of targeting Americans. But this has nothing to do with repulsing attack. This has to do with targeting individual people not involved in combat. That's what we've asked him to answer. And I think they've given an answer to the media, but we haven't received it yet. Yeah, I, I don't know if you're referring to this letter, but this just we just got this three minutes before you came on. It's addressed to Apparently you. Apparently they sent it to you guys before they sent it to us because well, we haven't gotten Let me it be yet. the first to read it to you then. It's from the Attorney General of the United States. It's directed to you. And it says, Dear Senator Paul, it has come to my attention that you have now asked an additional question. Does the president have the authority to use a weaponized drone to kill an American not engaged in combat on American soil? The answer to that question is no. Sincerely, Eric Holder. Hooray! For 13 hours yesterday, we asked him that question. And so there is a result in a victory. Under duress and under public humiliation, the White House will respond and do the right thing. It took a month and a half to get them to admit that the CIA doesn't operate in the United States. That's been the law since 1947. So now, after 13 hours of filibuster, we're proud to announce that the president is not going to kill unarmed Americans on American soil. My next question would be, why did it take so long? Why is it so hard? And why would a president so jealously guard power that they were afraid to say this? But I am glad, and I think that answer does, that question, the answer does answer my question. We talked in our last hour before you came on about what an extraordinary th thing you did in uniting senators like John Cornyn of Texas, a conservative, Marco Rubio of Florida, uh, along with the ACLU and Code Pink, uh, all standing on the <laughs> same side on an issue. But, but it wasn't unanimous, and, and the, the partisan factions on this are, they divided in an unexpected way. 
Uh, some other Republicans, including John McCain and Lindsey Graham, were not so happy with what they witnessed from you yesterday, suggesting you'd done a disservice to Americans. I want to let you hear some of what they said and give you the chance to respond, sir. We've done a, I think, um, a disservice to a lot of Americans by making them believe that somehow they're in danger from their government. They're not. But we are in danger. We are in danger from a dedicated, long-standing, easily replaceable leadership enemy that is hell-bent on our destruction. That he wants this president to tell him that he will not use a drone to kill an American citizen sitting in a cafe having a cup of coffee who is not a combatant. I find the question offensive. Two points there. Number one, they suggest you're focused on the wrong danger. Number two, they think you're, you're demeaning the, the office of the presidency. Your thoughts? The reason the question is asked is precisely because of the theories behind Senator McCain and Graham's logic. They think the whole world is a battlefield, including America, and that the laws of war should apply. The laws of war don't in, involve due process. So Senator Graham has been very explicit on the floor to say, when they ask you for an attorney, you tell them to shut up. That's not sort of my understanding of the way America works. It's not the way it un I understand when an American would be accused of a crime, that they would tell them, if you want a lawyer, to shut up. So I don't think the laws of war apply to America. I think the Bill of Rights do. And I think it's a disservice to our soldiers that we have senators up there arguing that the Bill of Rights aren't important. This was a very serious question. It was a question that took me a month and a half to get an answer to. And so I would argue, and I think that a lot of the public would agree with me, both on the right and the left, that what we asked was a very serious question. Yeah. And it's a question that I think we finally got an answer to. So the president apparently thought it was a serious enough question to answer. Last, so, uh, uh, sorry, Max, apologies. We're, we're wrapping up, but I want to ask you quickly. I know you got tired, stood for 12 hours, <laughs> couldn't take bathroom breaks. Anything you'd do differently if you had to do it again? Um, I would have eaten a bigger breakfast. I uh, really hadn't planned on doing it until we walked in that moment. And you never know whether the floor will be open. Usually the floor is sort of held captive by the majority party and they won't let you get up there and talk. They'll let you talk for specified times. So I was fortunate that the floor was open and that I had an issue I cared passionately about. And I think it's a good idea for the country to have a real debate sometimes about does the Bill of Rights apply? Some of the questions aren't easy. This yeah. is about terrorism, too. So does the Bill of Rights apply, and when does it apply is a really significant question. Well, it's a good thing you had that, uh, that candy desk, little-known candy <laughs> desk in the U.S. Senate and the Milky Way candy bar. Senator, thank you so much for being here. Mr. Rand went to Washington, everyone. Mr. Paul. Hmm.